Thank you so much, Reverend Dozier. So now I would like to introduce Congressman Mo Brooks. Congressman Mo Brooks of Alabama's 5th District as a stalwart defender. Have we got any folks from Alabama here? We got a whole bunch of folks from Alabama. As a defender of, America, of the American worker, he has been in the fight against illegal immigration from his first day on the Hill, working to rally both his fellow members and constituents in the defense of the rule of law. He said that the Senate's Gang of Eight bill threatens the future of our country, and he has called this bill a disaster for the African American community. Let's give a good warm welcome for Congressman Mo Brooks! Thank you. Thank you so much. My remarks may be a little bit different than what you're accustomed to hearing. In this immigration debate, there has consistently been a lot of emotionalism that's been interjected rather than facts and numbers. And what I want to do is share with you some information that you can use, that you can take back home to help people understand why the Senate Gang of Eight bill must be stopped at all costs. One of the arguments made is that if we oppose open border amnesty, that we lack compassion. Well, I want to share with you information that proves that the United States of America has been and always will be one of the most compassionate and generous and kind-hearted nations in the world when it comes to immigration. But we can be compassionate and still stop something that goes to such great excess that it's a danger to our country. And that in mind, let me share with you some information that the other side doesn't want to talk about. How many foreigners do we allow into our country to become United States citizens? How many foreigners do we allow into America to receive our highest privilege, that of citizenship? Now to hear the other side of the aisle say it, you would think that we're oppressing foreigners and we want to stop immigration. But that's not the history of the United States of America and that's not what we're talking about here today. In 1963, 124,000 foreigners were made American citizens. They earned that. In 1973, it was 120,000. In 1983, it was 178,000. Notice the trend, our generosity, our compassion. In 1993, it was 313,000. A decade ago, in 2003, it was 462,000. Over the last five to six years, this is an important number. Last five to six years, at no time have we had fewer than 600,000 foreigners who were granted citizenship under current law, and we had as many as a million in one year, 2008, that were granted citizenship. That shows you where we are as a nation. But what does the Senate bill do? The Senate bill, Gang of Eight, that we have to stop, in effect, either legalizes or admits into our country over the next decade, according to the Department of Homeland Security and other sources, 44 million foreigners. Now, when I talk about these numbers of 600 and some odd thousand one year on the low side in the last six years, or over a million foreigners who were granted our most cherished right citizenship during that six year period of time, I want to emphasize something. In terms of raw numbers, there is no nation on earth, no nation on earth that has been as generous with the number of citizenships that we, the United States of America, have given to foreigners. So we cannot, we cannot let the other side try to portray us as mean-spirited when the facts show that America is the most compassionate and generous nation in the world. Let's, let's also be clear about another matter. What is the cause? Why are we here today? We are here today because our presidents, George Bush the first, Clinton, George Bush the second, and the per current individual in the White House have not been enforcing the laws that are on the books. If our last four presidents were simply to enforce the laws that are on the books, we would not be talking about amnesty. We would not be talking about citizenship. We would not be talking about immigration laws, except to the extent that we would be doing so to tweak them a little bit in order to encourage foreigners who have unique skill sets that our economy needs to come into America. 
but it's the abdication of responsibility for over two decades by the people who have been in the White House who have refused to enforce our laws that puts us in the condition we are in today. So the problem is not with the laws, the problem is with the presidents that we've had for the last 20 years that have refused to enforce the laws that we have. Now, what is the impact of these huge numbers that the Senate Gang of Eight wants to foist upon the American people? 44 million that will either be legalized who are already here or who will be brought into our country. Well, I want to again share with you some statistics that the news media doesn't want to share with you. The Congressional Budget Office, the economic impact of Senate Bill 744 report that was issued in June of 2013, just last month. Under this bill, and these are their numbers, and keep in mind that they probably are more liberal than the true facts are, and the CBO has a history of doing their best, but unfortunately being wrong much more often than not. They say that under Senate Bill 744, we will have a lower, lower per capita GDP. Now, you'll see the proponents of these huge immigration numbers tell you that our gross domestic product will go up. Well, of course it will go up if you add 44 million people over the next decade, but that's not the issue. The issue is, do we as individuals have an increasing standard of living or a depressing standard of living? And even the CBO admits that over the next 10 years that the Senate Gang of Eight bill passes, our gross domestic product per capita per person declines. And that means that it's bad for the average American and that our average American income will decline. It's not the big number that counts, it's the number per capita that is important. Additionally, according to the Congressional Budget Office, they admit that there will be an increase in the unemployment rate through 2020. And all this makes sense. You bring 44 million people into our economy who are now not in America, or you legalize those 10 plus million who are already here, and you're gonna have a huge influx of people who are competing for jobs. And we know where the United States Chamber of Commerce stands on this issue. They don't care about American jobs, they care about their profits. And if it means, if it means that they have to hire foreign workers who will work at a cheaper rate, if it means that they have to hire foreign workers who will not abide by our job safety laws, then the United States Chamber of Commerce is gonna do that because that increases their profit level. Well, these are American jobs for American citizens. And I'm sorry, United States Chamber of Commerce, if you want to betray, if you want to betray Americans who want these American jobs, but we're gonna do our best to stop you. And so that's the motivation on the right. On the left, the motivation, of course, is to create another group of people who will be dependent on the federal government for their livelihoods. The demographics of foreigners, unfortunately, the demographics of foreigners who come into America, particularly since we went to this welfare state in the 1960s, is that they become more and more dependent on the federal government, on city, county, and state governments for their livelihoods. And what does that mean? Well, I don't know if you all have noticed, but we have a deficit problem. We have had four consecutive years of trillion dollar deficits. America's total debt burden is now $17 trillion, or we'll soon be blowing through that number. Now, what does that mean? That means that America is on a path to a debilitating insolvency and bankruptcy. If our central government is insolvent and goes into bankruptcy, there will be hell to pay. We will have one of the worst economic periods, one of the worst historical periods, in the United States of America's history. Probably one of the two or three worst, rivaling the Great Depression and World War II, rivaling the Civil War, because if our central government collapses under this burden of debt, think about what collapses with it. No national defense. All the Social Security and Medicare programs, there may or may not be funding for it. All of the other welfare programs, the safety net programs, well, if the central government goes insolvent and bankrupt, what's going to happen to them? 
What's going to happen to all the people who use those benefits in one way or the other? But most importantly, if we are stripped bare of our national defense, what do you think our enemies abroad are going to do while America's on their knees? Do you think they'll try to take advantage of us? Exactly. And history says they will. So we have to avoid, we have to minimize the risk of insolvency and bankruptcy as best we can. And you do that by bringing in foreigners who are going to be net tax producers, not net tax consumers. You bring in foreigners who are going to be a positive for our country, not a negative for our country. And unfortunately, the Senate Gang of Eight bill has it backwards. The Senate Gang of Eight bill brings in people who are going to be net tax consumers, not net tax producers. In that vein, Heritage Foundation has done a report and a study, and they've gone over the 50-year period of time from this day forward if the Senate Gang of Eight bill were to pass. And what does it say? It says $6.3 trillion in additional burden on American taxpayers and families. That's the net loss to American families at the city, at the county, at the state, and at the federal government level. It takes into account all the wealth transfer programs. That averages out to $126 billion per year over the next 50 years. We as a country cannot afford it. Now I mentioned all these folks that we've got around the world that want to come to the United States of America. And there are hundreds of millions of them. I'm not talking about no immigration. That's not where I am. What I'm talking about is smart immigration. And by smart immigration, I mean we bring in people who have the skill sets, who have the intellect, who have the money. They're going to be net tax producers so that they'll add to our country, not subtract to our lives. Now. I see the amnesty signs. I can only tell you where I am as a member of the United States Congress. I cannot in good conscience reward and ratify illegal conduct. If you want, if you want more illegal conduct, then you reward it. We should learn from the 1986 amnesty bill, but we haven't. History is our best instructor, and I encourage us to learn from history and understand that amnesty and rewarding of illegal conduct begets more illegal conduct. So anyone who tells you that this bill in the Senate solves the problem, they are misrepresenting the truth. It makes things worse economically. It makes things worse from an immigration standpoint.